we can use this, right? Yep. Do we need the okay. you want to do the acknowledgement? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, even though there's not a formal meeting, we are meeting in the uh, and acknowledge that we are conducting our business today on the unceded territory of the Skoyak Silish Okanagan people. As a council, we recognize the importance of doing our best to build resource respectful relationships and that contribute to stewarding the land and waters in the community with integrity and consideration for future generations. And with that, uh, we'll look at the Oyama Canal, <laughs> stewarding the water. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the uh, the topic here of, of the Oyama uh, Canal, I would like to introduce the first speaker. Uh, Mr. Jason Sleppy is, is a principal with Ecoscapes Environmental Consultants. And uh, he has worked on a, on a variety of different projects uh, in the valley here, uh, terrestrial, lake, stream ecosystems. Um, and he has been involved in, in a lot of uh, infrastructure projects, dams, bridges, culverts, and as well as in-stream uh, habitat restoration. In the discussions that uh, Jason and I had leading up to this, um, we we felt that, uh, well, staff felt and, and uh, that he would be probably the perfect person here to introduce this topic. Um, one of the things that we do realize is that there is a, an application process um, and also the actual construction, uh, sort of the complications and things that we run into. So we did want to bring to council uh, sort of the intricacies of, of this project. And uh, we just want to, I just would like to thank Jason for coming out and bringing his expertise to the table for us. Thank okay. you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome, Jason. Hello, everybody. I think I've been here at least once or twice before, so that's probably a good thing. Um, I'm rather casually dressed today, which was an accident, so hopefully you guys can all forgive me a little bit for that, for my t-shirt with a deer on it, but... Okay. Dredging. Dredging projects are complicated. They're multi-jurisdictional in nature, right? And because there's a potential to directly impact fish, their habitats or more specifically probably food for fish right in the shallow water regions of the lake there's multiple different agencies that are going to play a role okay there's your provincial agencies right so the provincial agencies you would need to be dealing with crown lands okay and lands is rights to space now does that mean that you need a lease or a tenure no not necessarily but you would maybe want to pursue a lease of tenure if you wanted to do this on a recurring and regular basis, okay? So with the province, there's sort of two components to it, right? First component is right to space, and second component is right to construct. Lands is the one, just like a lease, that gives you the right to the space to do work on Crown lands, okay? The right to do the work falls under a Section 11 process. Okay, so there's the two parts and pieces and you need both parts and pieces to do the project. Within Crown Lands, there are mechanisms available for a one-off where you can get a letter from Lands that says, you have authorization to do this project on a one-time basis. That pathway was utilized along the rail trail to do some of the erosion control works that I worked on through that ORT process, okay? So even within each of these different agencies, there's numerous different plausible pathways that one can take, okay? 
at least within lands. Okay, so any of those processes through Crown lands would have First Nations consultation guaranteed, right? Especially if you're going through a process to create a tenure or a lease for the an institutional lease, as an example, for the purposes of facilitating recreation, which is probably what it would fall under if that makes sense. Okay, so there's numerous different kinds of leases and tenures, but the most likely one would be one granted to an institution, the institution being white country, right? And for the purposes of recreation, even though the project is dredging, it's to facilitate recreation. So that's probably the style of the lease that would exist. Okay, section 11, right? So that's lands, right to space, section 11. Section 11 processes are going to involve both branches because it's going to be an approval. OK, Section 11 has two pathways. One is notification, simple culvert extension, replacement, notification, no First Nations consultation, still need engineering, environmental stuff, but easy to facilitate. Approval has First Nations consultation, must have engineering, right, which is an important component to all this, right? And you must address habitat related impacts, OK? So to have a complete application for a proposed dredge, right, with the province, at minimum, you would need to sort out crown lands and rights to space and sort out your section 11 process and get rights to construct, okay? And that rights to construct would involve the water group or engineering and the habitat group with biologists like myself. Okay, that's the provincial government. There is one other piece in the BC Environmental Assessment Act process that also may come up, and that's any dredging project that proposes to dredge over 2.5 hectares of land triggers a BC Environmental Assessment Act process. Now, would they trigger it for this? I don't know. It's just a note in a table, new projects for dredging over 2.5 hectares of land, it triggers that process, okay? Um, if you were to trigger that process, that then is like going through permitting a brand new big mine or something like that. Like it's that level of process. And 2.5 hectares is actually not a lot of land mass when you look at the width of the canal and the length. Like I haven't done the math, but using Google, you could probably pretty, pretty quickly figure out, is it going to be over or under 2.5 hectares? So that's another important trigger that I have not fully investigated, but I do know that it exists. OK, so those are the provincial agencies. Fisheries and Oceans Canada almost inevitably will play a role, okay? The impacts to fish and fish habitat are largely likely temporary in nature, okay? And by that, I mean you're going to do the work, you're going to dredge out the material, you're going to follow best management practices, do what you need to do, and after you dredge, it's going to take three months to 12 months, maybe more for that habitat to come back and make food for fish. And basically think about small aquatic insects, you dredge them out, they die. They then need to go through their life cycles, lay their eggs and recolonate the underlying sediments. Now, I'm not gonna get too much into sediment contaminants or other things, that's a full other thing that may exist and may, may be there and it is brought up by DFO as an example when DFO looks at dredging they first thing they do is they direct you to their operational statement for dredging right and that says all the things that you need to do to put together a good application for dredging within that you have your standard going to need some engineering going to need an environmental management plan for construction and I'll get a little bit into that when I talk about the construction side of this in a little bit right but they also bring up sediment contaminants and one of the ones that they bring up specifically that must be tested for is PCBs polychlorinated biphenols I think is is what it sounds I would need to look it up specifically but PCBs but having said that there may be a variety of other contaminants within the sediments that may also pose a concern right so there's both water quality really the risks plus these short-term impacts to fish and fish habitat as it relates to fish food right you're going to temporarily impact fish food because you're going to do that it's more than probable 
given the size of the project, that it would trigger a formal Federal Fisheries Act authorization process. I can't guarantee that. It's possible that it you may just get a letter of advice back and DFO says go deal with the province in a section 11. But if you were going to embark upon this, I would bank on a formal Federal Fisheries Act process. OK, Federal Fisheries Act processes are very similar to that of the province. They have First Nations consultation. They take time to happen, right? So last I heard to get a formal Federal Fisheries Act authorization through DFO, you needed eight different signatures to navigate through the federal government. OK, so it has to work its way up the food chain. Everybody has to review it, sign off on it and say, yes, this authorization is good and, and the offsetting that's accompanying it is you know, it makes sense for the project. When the Federal Fisheries Act changed in August 2019, okay, it went back to protection of all different fish species, not just fish of commercial or economic value. So historically, a long time ago before the, the act got gutted, it was all fish. And then there was this period of time when I've been in my career when we only really care about salmonids and fish that we eat, but now we're back to we care about all fish. Right. And I think where we're at now is better. We should care about all the fish. Right. Having said that, the fish species that are most likely there are minnows or saprinids, sculpins, those kind of things. So you can manage those risks through construction. It's possible to manage those risks and complete a construction project without having significant population level effects. Why can I say that? Because red side shiners are extremely fecund and they make a whole bunch more red side shiners. So even if you did harm some of them, which you would probably have some level of loss anticipated because you can't fully salvage the area, the population itself would not be unduly impacted, right? In the long run, provided that you have your mitigation measures in place. Other ones that I've thought of that may play a role would be somebody like Interior Health. You guys have a drinking water intake there. And this would be one that, and again, Heather is by far the person to talk to on, on some of these things, and she's, I believe, after me, but it would definitely be another thing that you'd want to talk about. And the reason being is when you transition to construction, managing turbid water and sediment is likely going to be a challenge because this is not sands and this is silts and marls and really small things that are very tough to contain with a standard sediment curtain, right? I've dragged the city of Kelowna boat launch for since the onset pretty much every year we go out and take out I think it's about 500 cubes of material out of that boat launch to keep it functioning but it's all sand and within the within the containment it gets dirty pretty quick but the outside it's easy to keep that material in it's reasonably sheltered and other things right long and short is is managing turbid water in this case could be a challenge and that level of requirement aside from fisheries related reasons is important because of your drinking water intake that stuff is probably not going to settle out and if you do have a big event right a curtain blows out or whatever which does happen it's happened to me a couple times on okanagan lake as an example you have all your gear set up and a big storm comes in and your whole work site is now sitting on the shoreline right so these are things that you would need to build into your construction project your construction budget to make sure that you're managing these risks accordingly, right? This isn't just send out a suction dredge and start sucking and put it in a geotube over there and you're good to go. It's more involved than that. It's much more complicated. Okay, if an application was gonna be submitted, right? Guaranteed you're gonna have your section 11 crown lands process with FUNRO, okay? Guaranteed you're gonna have your submission to DFO for a request for review, which I anticipate would trigger a Federal Fisheries Act authorization. The next important part of this is who is the applicant, right? Is the applicant the District of Lake Country? Is the applicant an adjacent landowner? Who is the person or entity that is going to bear responsibility for this application as it navigates its way through the process? The reason why I bring this up is Crown Lands will always consider adjacent property owners riparian rights. And this becomes interesting in the sense that if you were to submit an application, you would need your engineering to support and document that adjacent property owners rights through processes such as accretion are not impacted. 
And logically, one could look at this and say, how is that a problem? Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I don't know. But I've worked on other projects that have taken three to five years to navigate a process because the adjacent landowner was worried about their riparian rights. And they got a lawyer, the lawyer got involved, they talked to the province and the whole process just ground to a halt as you had to answer all of these questions as it relates to these riparian mm -hmm. rights of the adjacent landowner, okay? So consultation, First Nations, consultation with adjacent landowners that may be impacted, having everybody on board through some type of public process is important. If you were to go forward, and I speculate here, I would speculate that the district would stand a better chance of navigating an application through the process than any one entity. And the reason being is, is there's probably some level of government to government trust, right? Like the district isn't going anywhere, but if John bought a piece of property and he managed to facilitate this and then said, man, I don't want to do this anymore, sold that piece of property, but say had some long-term monitoring commitments, then the only action for the provincial government is likely through a civil process, right? So I'm working on another project right now that is similar, um, where the city of West Kelowna is, is working with landowners that want to facilitate a process, but the city themselves is the applicant. And the reason being is setting up the tenure, the right to space, and then the municipality can work directly with those landowners through some type of legal agreement to address what the provincial or federal concerns might be as it relates to things like riparian rights, right? I'm not saying that's how you should set it up, but rather if you're gonna embark upon this process, a bit of pre-work to figure out some of these things before you dive into the engineering and habitat and the details of an application is probably important. Okay, construction. The most probable way that this is gonna happen is probably through a suction dredge. It's probably gonna be, I don't think you can get a barge in there. I don't think you can operate. I mean, maybe you could operate a big long stick excavator from the bank possibly to do this, but that might be a challenge. There is a piece of equipment out there. Think mini excavator with extendable thing and suction dredge on the end of the, on the end of the boom and stick, right? And the big suction dredge, it goes down, right? Um, they work pretty well. They can move a decent amount of material, but they're expensive, right? They're 1200 to 1500 bucks an hour operation time. Okay. If you have a two week, six week construction period at 10 hours a day, you guys can start doing the math and figure out what construction costs are going to be, right? Setting up your worksite isolation, doing your water quality monitoring during, having your engineering, right? I would peg permitting between 100 and 500 K, right? To actually have a successful application. By the time you, and the reason why the upper limit is there is when you get into this sediment and wind and wave process, there's two ways to do it. One way is to have a good engineer say, yep, I've looked at it, done a bit of math, and here's my opinion and nothing's gonna happen. The other way to do this is to build a complicated model. Right, wind wave sediment model where you start factoring vector sediment size and then they got to build the model and run the model and run the iterations and modeling costs money and takes time right that's where the upper limit comes from if you have a whole bunch of engineering and a whole bunch of modeling to answer the provinces or federal government's questions right then it can cost a lot of money to set up those models to run those models Province comes back and says, oh, but you need to answer this question. Got to run the model again. Each iteration of the model takes 20 grand to run or 30 grand to run because of the processing time, et cetera. So that brings me back sort of to the a bit of pre-work to ask the province some of these questions is probably a good idea. That's the process that I'm embarking upon with the city of West Kelowna right now. We are engaging them, asking them questions. The problem with the current environment at the provincial level anyways is the directive is 
please focus on existing applications that have already been submitted, not ones that may come down the pipe, right? Like they want to get the ones that are actually formal applications, which I can appreciate, right? I mean, they have a capacity problem and they have a queue and they got to get the queue and backlog done. I'm not saying that they won't answer questions. Of course, they're going to sit down with you and answer questions. It's, you know, as you guys have heard about it, I'm sure that they've heard about it, right? Working on that West Kelowna one, I mean, the first thing that Crown Land said, well, we've heard about this and like everybody's aware. It's like, you know, they're aware that this elephant is standing in the room somewhere, right? Um, so I'm not saying they won't answer questions, but don't expect the process to be quick or inexpensive, right? It's going to take some time. And the biggest risk, I think, is probably the engineering side of this. From a habitat perspective, an environmental management plan for a job like this is not too hard to put together. The harder part is going to be collecting the baseline information for benthic invertebrate algal productivity. How much food is there for fish in this zone and what's the impact? We're going to need, you would need to quantify that, right? And so a good application and one that's likely to have legs and make it through the process is not only going to have your inherent startup costs for permitting, right? Then you're going to have your construction budget, which again, I mean, a half a million dollars doesn't sound unrealistic. If it's 1200 bucks an hour, it's going to take two weeks, right? Like that's not an unrealistic budget. It could be as much as a, you know, as much as a million dollars for construction, right? I would also plan and bank on some post habitat monitoring of some kind. My experience has been on some marina applications these days and other ones, they want post-construction monitoring for sediment. And is the information you gave us actually what we're observing? Have sediment accumulation rates changed? Is there deposition occurring somewhere now where we weren't expecting it to happen? That's gonna involve resurveying things, setting out sediment traps, that kind of thing. At the same time, I would also expect some Fisheries productivity, benthic invertebrates and algal periphyton communities. How fast does the community return back? Does it return back? Are we losing any rare and endangered invertebrate species? Those kind of things. So you're gonna need your baseline, you're gonna to have to collect. And then I would I would bank on year one, three, and five, probably post-construction monitoring. Okay. So those costs. 50 to 300 K probably right there. If you got to collect benthic invertebrate samples and you have to do biomass as an example, minimum of 10 probably to get a reasonable statistical average, right? Each of those samples is $400 just to process the sample. That's not collection of the sample or other things. And 10 would be the likely a minimum and it would be area dependent, right? I hope that I'm, um, I'm not trying to lead you guys astray. I'm giving you sort of a low bucket and a high bucket and the high bucket shouldn't be taken lightly. I, I'm not saying it is going to go that way. It's just don't underestimate it. It could very well easily go that way because all it takes is what seems like a simple question to answer sometimes can be very complicated in my world, right? Actual construction. How are you going to do this? Okay. We're going to Dredge a channel. We're going to mow boat, set suction dredge. We're going to set up our worksite isolation, keep all of our sediment in. We're probably going to want to double contain that because we have sediment that's hard. You're going to need to do a fish salvage, pull out all the fish, get your suction dredge in there. You're then going to need access to land because the suction dredge has to pump that stuff somewhere. Now you could pump it to a barge out in the lake and then try and contain it on a barge, but that's probably a very hard thing to do. So what's commonly done and how the city of Kelowna handled this, they use these things called geotubes. And just imagine a really big sock, right? That can be like the length of this room and you fill the sock with sediment. So the sock and dredge pumps the sediment into the sock. The sock filters out the water and keeps the sediment in the big sock, right? Those socks are like three or four grand for a 250 meter cubed one you never actually get 250 meters cubed and you get maybe 180 out of it by the time it's done and workable then you got to get another one there right so even the materials to do and they're disposable it's used once and done right you can't even recycle it um where i envision some challenges using that method which would slow down construction time and i haven't i've been mulling it over in my head and i don't have an answer yet i've been thinking about it like how do you do this how do you do this how do you do this right the problem is is because of that fine material, 
it's like a sieve, right? And the sieve has pore spaces that the water goes through, but that really fine material clogs up all the pores and then the water doesn't leave the tube. Well, you need the water to leave the tube to dewater the material to then take that dredge eight somewhere, right? So you'd probably have to problem solve that a little bit and there's probably ways to do it, but it may be worth a test to see, like, can you actually suction dredge this stuff, right? Because if you can't suction dredge it or you can't dewater it, right? Or your dewatering costs are gonna cost you 200 grand or 300 grand just to do that, then, you maybe want to know that information up front. I don't know. I'm just speculating a little bit, knowing about the material. It's fine, marl bottom. It's not easy to work with like sand. Um, okay. For construction, I'm guessing a standard like tender contract would work, right? Um, that wouldn't be a problem. Um, you'd probably want to have somebody administer that contract for you guys, right? So your standard, you know, procurement process would work just fine for this with a good set of engineering drawings and environmental management plan. I would encourage the district not to um, put too much of that on the contractor, but still try and maintain their own engineering oversight, their own environmental oversight so they can control the job should you choose to go down this path. Um, obviously, there would be environmental monitoring full time in water works um, and First Nations archaeological or environmental observers would likely be on site as well. That's a very common thing. OK, so permitting times, I'd bank on a one to three year permitting period. One's maybe a bit ambitious. Three is probably more feasible. That's highly dependent upon your crown land tenure process. Crown lands right now, if you just cold call and say, how long does a tenure take? They're telling people two to three years. OK, so there's ways to expedite that and government stands a much better chance of doing that. Um, I'd bank on probably a two month construction period, right? Just for now, you know, get everything set up, get your fish salvage done. So basically a July, August construction period. Um, and I've kind of gone roughly over the cost. Permitting could be 50 to 100K on a low end if things go really smoothly, could be 300 to 500 if you have to get into some heavy engineering modeling, right? Obviously you want to try and direct a process to prevent that, but if they ask questions or they want information in a certain way and a model's the best way to do it, you're kind of backed into a corner, right? Construction costs, probably 200,000 to a million bucks, depending upon total quantity of dredge, how much material you're moving and what's the dewatering plan. Is that sediment contaminated? Does it need to be treated or go to a special facility? All these questions would need to be answered, right? Post-construction monitoring costs, again, I would bank on it. 50 to 300 K depending upon how many samples total area, those kind of things, right? So all in, this is probably like a 500 to $800,000 job to over 2 million, depending upon how complicated and messy it gets. All information that I'm sure that you guys maybe don't want to hear, but I'm trying to give you a good spread and the complications. And I'm <clears throat> ready now to take questions because I've kind of gone over a lot of different things and I'm sure that you may have some questions ask. Okay, we have a couple of, uh, uh, Kara, um, you're first up. Oh, sorry. That might be. Thanks, Jason, for your presentation and truly scary in terms of numbers and complexities, but um, thanks for laying it out so clearly. My my one question, and usually people have having one, um, is the city of Kelowna, if they're doing this annually and they're dredging their boat launch, how can they do this annually? No, but the process, the permitting, the, the everything we've just talked about, how can they do that annually? Oh, okay. So what they've done is they set up the process for the property to the city of Kelowna. They have all their complicated models, all that kind of stuff, and they set it up, I believe, for three or four years to go back every year. Okay. So they've been renewing their permits, doing those kind of things. The scale of that job, is much smaller than the scale of this job. It's really a space that is from that to the end of the wall and to the wall to block. Right? There's a lot of material that are moving because the back sand flood is coming towards them, but the space itself is quite small. They don't have full construction monitoring for habitat, but they do have full survey every year and see where sand is going and those kinds of things. It's the same process, but small scale. Yeah. Or, or 
Thanks. Uh, and my question is uh, um, where, <laughs> very similar, but uh, where in Kelowna is this being done? And are you aware of other examples in the valley uh, that you're a little bit familiar with where dredging has been done? I'm aware. So the only one that I'm aware of is in Kelowna. And where is that? It's at the Coast Street Bowl all the hours, basically. Okay. Right? I took so the most highly controlled area. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I'm aware of some other marinas that have been trying for a couple of years to try and navigate through the process to do some branding in that marina. But my observation has been they're underestimating what they need to do and they keep trying to blame the government. Government's not doing their job. They're too slow permitting. It's like, yeah, but have an answer all the questions. You haven't given them what they want, right? That's why I emphasize so much what your submission, your submission matters, right? If you truly want to do this, you bite the bullet. You do what you need to do to get through a process with a good work program, right? This isn't like, oh, well, what did you do this, this, and this, and submit a person permit all the facts. You're just going to get bogged down and sit in no man's land for one but it strikes me that um, you know this community is you know probably 100 and over 100 years old and over the years i believe that dredging has happened um our kokanee uh, is you know the only time i'm aware that it was such a disaster was after we blasted the hillside away and i think had real impacts on the fish population so uh, you know it just strikes me Odd that we, you know, we we have let it go for so long. Um, and if we were going to embark on it, um, certainly I appreciate that you've given us some really good information here. But right. uh, it it's something that uh, I would hope we would get a permit that could be used every three years or four years, whatever is reasonable, providing providing it doesn't have long-term negative impacts on the kokanee and whatever other uh, fish we have. I mean, definitely um, these are things that we would want to look after properly. Dredging is generally viewed a high risk for Right? There's potential for direct impact to fish and fish all the time. Does that mean that you can't grab a definite navigate application? No. If you can demonstrate a good need for it and a good rationale, odds are you can get support for it through the process. But to work through the process, you got to go through all of your baseline work and put together a good application as good as possible. In hearing what you're saying, if this is something that you want to do possibly on a regular or week or interval, right, you're going to want to have the ground land tenure yeah. in the district's name and set it up as such and then try and set up a process like that. Ironically, when I started my career, uh, 2002 in the open autumn, one of the first projects I had was measuring sediment depth in the Oceana Canal. <laughs> right? so, look at, right. so I find it ironic that I started there, and here I am, whatever, 15 years later, back having the same discussions. So this has been around for a long time. I do not think that can help Greg. I want to buy the price. Yeah. yeah. Um, Bill. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jason, very much. Uh, I've been around a long time, too. and. And we've been talking about this for a long, long time. So I've I've heard the process that you've talked about, and it sounds to me like it's a hundred to three hundred thousand dollars to get past the permitting stage in three years of time. Uh, then we have to wait for the appropriate construction window, which could take another year. And then we have a two-month construction period and perhaps a million-dollar cost. And then we have monitoring for three to five years after after that. So no matter how we anticipate or go forward with this project. Uh, it's a 10-year project, and like you said, anywhere from a million to two million dollars. You called her. Uh, you told us that under the provincial uh, administration, that this would fall under a recreational need. That's what you referred to it as, and I completely agree. Um, probably the fish and the habitat don't particularly need us to dredge that thing. It's simply for recreation and boats and travel. So. If we were to remove a reasonable amount of material from that area that I believe is larger than 2.5 hectares, uh, uh, you don't think so? Okay, good. That would be great if it wasn't. But if we have to remove that much material, 
Um, in the, I know you're a biologist, not a geologist or hydrologist, but in your opinion, would we need to, uh, as Councillor Gamble has spoken, would we need to address it again in five to ten years? Uh, yes, <laughs> or an opinion. Whatever your platform is, right? Like you're going to try and create a whatever that should happen, happens later, right? Shape. But depending on how wave currents and other things and how that slot works, right? And what your rates of definition are will determine your frequency. These would be good questions to ask. Preliminarily, what is our definition rate of the account? How much material is settling on a year over year basis? Are we getting two millimeters or two inches, right? Without that, using frequency is really hard. I do know though that when you set up your initial thread, as hard as you're going to try to shoot for whatever engineering shape you come up with, those guys are working blind as they're sucking thread, right? Like it's going to have bumps and bumps, and it's not going to be a perfectly smooth, like excavated channel, right? It'll probably depend upon what that radius swap is and how those banks stabilize into the center over time. And I can't ask that question. I'm guessing three to five years is probably on the low end. I'm guessing it's probably on a 10 to 20 year frequency. Once every 10 to 20 years, am I going to have to go out and take 50 centimeters of material up for whatever, 80 centimeters, whatever your, your depth, whatever your target depth right. is? So, to, to, to be kind of clear, just to clean it up for myself, before we even initiated the application, to the provincial government, you suggested that we do several things, one of which is consultate with all of the adjacent landowners. The second, I think I just heard, was to collect baseline data. Uh, we'd probably do that through a group like your own, correct? And the third would be to do some engineering, to what degree? I would come up with a financial box, so basically how, estimate how much material you need to take out, right? So to create a navigable channel, right, through this, um, what's that like? Navigation, Map Canada, Transport Canada, Run Map Canada, they're the ones that set up. Within 30 meters of shoreline, you guys usually have the ability to put up speed void and all these other things within 30 meters. That shouldn't be a problem. Get outside that 30 meter buffer from shore and then you pop it down to the corner and set up there. Within the channel property, you'll probably set up some of this stuff. Why that matters is you're going to want to have some idea of what boat size you're trying to accommodate, what the draft of those boats is, and how deep they sit in the water. That then sets your target depth and how much water you need. Once you know the target depth and how much water you need during your operating season, you then figure out what the volume of material is and plan profile. That gives you a so You're going to survey it, you're going to get depths, you're going to figure out how much material you need to take out. That <coughs> being impacts your budget. More material, more budget. So your first questions you're going to want to ask are, Talk to any adjacent residents see if they have any concerns. Probably going to want to start for stations consultation nice and early and deal with OPID and what's that for and say, hey, we have this project, this is what we're doing. Um, then get out and set some preliminary baseline data for how much material you want to move, about what that's going to cost to formalize the projects a little bit so you have it. Right? Like to set up a budget to, to navigate the process. Ted does. No, um, just one last little thing. So, in our application process with the province, would we run at the same time our application province uh, with the with the feds? Yes. They would go concurrent. Everything runs concurrent, but each different agency has to undertake their own planning process. Oh, yeah. Has their own process. Everybody has their own process, but they can occur concurrently. So, just in my humble estimate, it sounds like it would be. A year or two to get to the place where we could apply. Unless we. Well. You have all your ducks in a row, probably collect all your baseline data sometime this winter, provided that you can navigate that channel easily. And it's possible you can start your application process by next fall, right? But that is theoretically possible. Thank you for your answers, Jason. Appreciate you. Okay. Todd. Thank you, Mr. Merritt. Thanks, Jason. Um, so I appreciate the uh, long, the long version of that. Um, so 
The uh, canal actually was dredged within the last two years um, by hand. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was actually done deep enough that boats could pass through at higher water levels. Um, so that's quickly um, disappeared and now it's that's the lowest I've ever seen it. I took my boat through the other day and walked it through and it was um, my knees were out of water. So it's not very deep um, and, and it's very, very soft sand now so there's not a real hard bottom so my fear would be you go through this whole process and uh, then it just sloughs off again because a lot of that come from underneath the bridge which is also eroding away so I don't think it's a matter of um, just pulling that stuff out and saying hey it's not going to you know not going to return because it is there's going to be sediment that's going to come back there so if you're going to do this, I would rather see this done once and you put some kind of um, bottom in there, a little more like the Penticton channel where it's it doesn't pile up, right? And, and I get it that you're trying to protect the fish and stuff and me being a fisherman and stuff, I pay attention to the fish in there and, um, you know, it's, it, it's definitely something there that... Uh, that it would be affected for sure but um like you say i, I think if you're going to go through this process it, it's got to be done a little more permanently or something there that's not going to fill right back in again because that would be pretty frustrating to watch that whole all go for naught um so with um andrew spear is um has applied for this and he's got that application in there and the holdup that uh, I've been told was the uh, ownership of that canal. So because that's a man-made canal, um, the, I, the, the last idea I heard was that it was Camp Activa that actually potentially owns that. And then once they figure out that, then they can pro you know proceed along with that application. So. You know he's trying to get it done and at some point he's talking about doing the vacuum truck as well those are private citizens doing that right um how i'm just curious how that's possible if you don't have involvement of the people that actually own it like if that's not crown land Michael had some um, title. Uh, was there a tow path along that canal that you were saying that uh, was Crown Land? That uh, that microphone on? Um, in the discussions that I had with Crown Land regarding this application, there was. Uh, couple of things you, you are correct they were sort of trying to sort out uh, the land ownership and uh, it looked like uh, with the surveys which they were still working through that um, Camp Tikva does have at least half of the canal um, and there was also on on part of it uh, there's a statutory or a, an easement I guess in the old days there were um, barges that they would draft that would that would come through horses would would bring them through the bring so far then the horses would pick them up and they would take them through but uh like i say uh, in jason's opening comments the uh this is complicated and even in the discussions that we had with crown lands they were sort of trying to figure their way through um who what why and where and, and, yeah. and bringing this forward uh, i think the application was still blair had a question oh, not done yet. oh sorry todd not finished um uh -huh. so don't go away Jason. one one other big concern there is obviously that's the lowest I've ever seen that lake now we had a little uh, boo-boo at the other end of uh, Okanagan Lake by letting all the water out prematurely um, so now we're going to pay for it because that water is super low so if that goes lower who knows how much lower it can go I don't think it'll get down that much but there's not going to be very much water running through there and seeing that that is our water supply and stuff um that's where i'd be a little more concerned again is because uh you know at some point 
if that was to keep going down, something's going to happen, right? So. No, I and it's why I brought up lands, riparian rights, and ownership. It's an integral part of the application, and if I was running that application, I wouldn't have even sorted. I wouldn't even submitted it until I had that stuff straightened out because it's full stop, right? Like. When you submit a section 11 to the province, step one is Crown Lands and Front Counter BC. Lands just says, do you have rights to do what you're doing and rights to space? That application is parked most likely, I'm speculating entirely, but it's parked until they resolve those issues. Once it does that, it's gonna clear Front Counter most likely, and I'm speculating, I don't know this. It's gonna clear Front Counter and then the actual application review process will start, okay. right? Um, lands will, you need to sort lands out. Who owns it, right? What rights do you have? Is there multiple property owners? Where's present natural boundary if that exists? Like those are all integral to the startup okay. to get a kick at it. And then afterwards, if you start talking about some of the permanent structures, like what you talked about to stop sediment from going in, they're good ideas. They will possibly add to any offsetting with DFO because now you're permanently altering the habitat. If you want to put a concrete bottom or a riprap bottom down there, that's going to change the habitat type. That may equal more compensation dollars. Not saying it's not possible, not saying it's not a good idea, but rather each of those different elements would come into sort of what is the best engineering solution for a project like this. Okay, because yeah, if you go down to the other end of Cal Lake, where it's leaving the lake and you look, that's not natural, right? That's all concrete all the way through there and it's loaded with fish, right? So I look at that and go, okay, obviously the fish like that, but again, that's all for guys like yourself to decide, right? But um, um, the other thing that, uh, oh, what the heck was it? I had one more question there. Um, oh, when, when you said that sock, um, what I understood, and I've heard this a couple times, is when you pull that sand out of there, they don't want the water leaching back out. So now you're saying you're putting the sand into a into a sock. Now the water's running out. Now what I was told is that's what they're mainly concerned about, that whatever the contaminants are possibly in that water leaching back into the water, which always seems to be a little bit of a question mark but that's what i've heard is the number one concern i just curious when you're saying you're putting in the sock where is that water going and so if the material is not contaminated right the biggest risk you're trying to control is turbidity so you have your sock it goes right back into your work site so you already have a turbid work site it's already dirty you're just putting the dirty water back where the dirty water is to dry out the material. If the material is contaminated with X or Y, then no, you probably couldn't put the water back. And that again, changes the application process because now you have a different level of construction cost. Now you're not only need to get rid of sediment, you need to get rid of water and water's heavy, right? So there's multiple different ways that that could work on a construction side of it. The way the city of Cologne does it, the water goes right back into the containment and we manage turbidity, which is the biggest risk at that site. And that is manageable. It's a couple silk curtains and a geotube, you can manage that, okay. right? Thanks. This one may be harder because on either end, you may need some, you know, booms or something to stop it from blowing ashore, but manageable. Okay, thanks. Um, Blair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks, Jason. That's, that's a great uh, explanation. Um, just a couple of things. In, in terms of the, uh, I suppose, protecting our water intake, I mean, that's obviously something that Kelowna doesn't have to deal with. Uh, their water intake is nowhere near there. And I mean, I grew up right in that area, so I know how that sand works and how it moves. Um, but this is a whole different story. So we've talked a lot uh, about the lake shore, the lake bottoms and, you know, the current wakeboard boats and the, the PCBs and the hydrocarbons that are existing under that silt layer that are just sitting there and they're, they're never going away, but they're sitting there relatively safely if they're not disturbed. We have a water intake that's not very far from there. Can it be protected? That's probably a better question for Heather. 
Okay, well, answer. I can save that one. Yeah, yeah, I would save that one for Heather because she has a lot yeah. more experience on the contaminant side of things, but it's a risk that would need to be managed. And currently it's a risk that we know there's stuff there. We just don't know how much or how bad it is. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I know. Yeah, uh, well, I'd say there's no doubt there's stuff there. Uh, you know, we've got orchards and things that have been putting stuff in that water for a long time. Yeah. Um, the next question would be the sock. If the sock's contaminated, where does it go? Is there is there a place for it to go? Depends upon what the contaminants are and what the disposal site is. There's hazardous waste disposal sites. Some landfills will take it. I would, without knowing what the contaminants of concern are, it's challenging to say where you could take it. Yeah. Right. But there, there may be there. I, I suppose what I'm asking that there, that could be a problem. Could be a problem if there's things in there that are really challenging to dispose of. Yes. You know, because we've seen this with biosolids and those kind of things from from plants where nobody wants it. All of a sudden, nobody wants it. You're creating it. You gotta it's gotta go someplace, but you can't take it anywhere. Agreed. So. Which would probably be another good thing to ask preliminarily. Where are we gonna take the material and what's in it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. It was, it was a great, uh, great preamble there. So yeah, I have you. a question, to, uh, Jason. Uh, the um, my, uh, looking, at, I've been involved with, and uh, and the was dredge not. It was during the um, regional district did it once when I was on the regional board. I can't remember the date, but um, the um, uh, seems to me the sediment is not just erosion in the canal. But that we have so much coming uh, out of Oyama side and the uh, Wood Lake side uh, from Vernon Creek, that uh, I wondered if uh, I mean, but if it if it is erosion in the canal bank, then would um, sheet piling uh, enable a little bit of current to move it along better or? Uh, you know, because I mean, a lot of canals have their sides bricked or uh, stone filled or whatever. But uh, yeah. this, I mean, we don't. My difficulty is with the kind of numbers that we're talking, and we don't really own the canal, and we never built it. Uh, it was supposedly done for navigable waters, and they and the feds looked after it for a time, but. Uh, they're not doing that anymore. They're not even doing it in the oceans anymore. But their federal docks seem to be disappearing. But yeah. So anyway, what, so what, what about sheep hunting? What about fixing the sides of the canal? It would definitely help with localized erosion and bank failure, right? Having mm -hmm. said that, I don't think all the sediment in the canal is coming from the banks of the canal, but rather a lot. you have a bit of current. It's picking it up yeah. at the mouth. It's yeah. slowly depositing as it goes through. It's probably coming from a variety of different sources. And I mean, Heather can talk about the rates of just the marl precipitate out yeah. coming out of the out of the water column, right? Like it's there's a variety of different sediment sources, and I don't know where they're all coming from to say yes or no to that question. Could it help? Yes. Sheet piling is expensive. Okay. Thank you. Any any other questions for Jason? Then we can hear from Heather. Yeah. Okay. Talk. Just in case uh, this progresses, um, the water always doesn't flow from Wood Lake to Cal Lake. It's yeah. about 10% of the time it's flowing the other Coming way. From and I'll tell people that and they'll go, yeah, yeah, whatever. Well, <laughs> I, I walk over their lots and I see it going the other way. So yeah. it might, sediment might be coming from Cal Lake as well. Very well could be. Right. From the Yama side. Thanks. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope I answered your questions and yeah. good luck with your deliberations on this one. I uh, don't yeah. envy your position. Well, Michael, do you got somebody else talking? Good evening, your, hey. your, your worship, members of council. I'm going to I'm going to introduce uh, Heather Lorette uh, with Lorette Aquatic Consulting. Um, so uh, Heather's uh, going to talk a little bit about should so um you know jason's been talking about what's involved and how we go about it um heather's going to talk about should we do it and uh heather's uh been working on on this water body uh for us uh in in, in partnership with uh the regional district north of Anagan and Coldstream. uh this 24 summer now so uh, I, I i suggest heather's probably got more expertise on on this water body than anybody and, and her team 
And uh, so we've got, you know, we've got a lot of, we've built a lot of knowledge over the years. Um, and uh, that's really useful for us to be able to track our things changing. And this year we are seeing things change. Um, and, it, and it's a bit concerning. It's worrisome, uh, the changes that we're seeing right now. And, and so Heather's gonna talk about this, this quite a bit. Um, so, you know, the question of should, should we do it? And, you know, is everything fine in, in paradise? Maybe not, maybe not right now. And uh, I think we'll, we'll, uh, Heather will probably explain why this may not be a good idea. Okay, so with you. that, I'll turn it over to, to Heather. Mm -hmm. Get this up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. It's always a privilege to come and talk to you. And we're going to be talking specifically about judging the Oyama channel between Wood and Kalamaka Lakes, as you know. Um, I just wanted to point out that the work that you've funded over the years gives us a basis and a background to address the science behind what um, can take place uh, when we embark on this kind of project. So this is just an aerial view of the area we're talking about. Um, I guess in our minds we can always think of the narrow channel itself, but it actually extends in both directions to wood and cow. Boating and especially power boating and the large power boats do affect the sediments for a considerable distance beyond the channel proper. So the three things that I want to talk about very briefly today is the contaminated sediment disturbance affecting the channel area. What happens if you increase the water exchange between Wood and Kalamaka Lakes? What can happen with the increased boating traffic? So in every lake, including these ones, the sediments are the storehouse for basically the history of that lake. All contaminants, all metals, everything, they, the sediments act as a reservoir. This is inevitable and it's a very beneficial service. In a lake, um, and the metals you see here, those contaminants are the ones that we have identified in Cal and Wood Lake sediments. Cool. The key sources are Cold Stream Creek, stormwater, and power boating. And contaminants that are buried by more than five centimeters of sediment, without turbulence, those are gone. Those are sealed, those are no longer interacting with the water column. The challenge before us now is what we could have traditionally considered to be sealed and gone is now being potentially resuspended. So, oh dear, this is awfully small. I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, the Cal Oyama channel, I put a box around it. This is just looking at hydrocarbons. So those are the contaminants that originated with petroleum products. And you can see that we have exceedances for the three on the bottom, fluoranthrene, phenylanthrene, and pyrene. Um, and that would not be sufficient sampling to satisfy the permitting requirements. This was an initial look where we did a whole series of cores through different areas of the lake, batched them together, and sent them to the lab. These are expensive and difficult tests to run, but certainly they're very doable. We did not look at other types of contaminants. And I think you can see that Oyama Channel is coming out similar to, and actually a little worse than the marinas. Core three was by a um, stormwater outfall. So there's a lot of blame to go around a lot of different contaminant sources. It's not surprising that the water chemistry above the sediments can meet all guidelines, but the sediments can fail. So once we kick that sediment up into the water column, it'll tend to stay there. The sand and silt particles will drop out quite quickly. Clay, bacteria, and materials that dissolve back out of that sediment once it's disturbed take weeks to resettle, if at all. Um, 
I don't like it when lakes that I've studied for decades suddenly do something that I've never seen them do before. Um, as, as Greg intimated, the cyanobacteria bloom that you see in the April and May shots of Wood Lake is not new, that we've had those periodically, not usually that early in the season, but it has happened. So those light uh, greenish streaks you see in April 17 became a solid murky mass by May 9. And that is cyanobacteria, so they have the potential for cyanotoxicity and um, other impacts on the water chemistry. From a food chain perspective in a lake, cyanobacteria are the junk food. So they're not good for the food chain. They're just signaling to us that there is trouble afoot in that environment. Flows usually go from wood to Kalamaka lakes, depending on the elevation of lakes, it can backflow but typically they're flowing forward. So we have seen in the past, when there's a cyanobacteria bloom on Wood Lake, it can um, be seen in the samples that we take from the South Kalamaka drinking water intake. Low concentrations, but we do see that connectivity between the lakes where an event that's occurring in Wood Lake can affect Kalamaka Lake. The image on the uh, right is a microscope image those little rocket ship looking things are called serratium. And right now, Wood Lake is doing a serratium bloom, which we have not seen before. And like I said, I don't like that. Usually you see uh, serratium where there's a ton of bacteria that has abruptly shown up in an environment. I am wondering if wood ash is, is behaving similarly. So from the wildfires that we've had, I'm wondering if that's partially triggering it. I do not. I do not know. There's two other lakes in British Columbia currently with a serration bloom. They're both high nutrient and both the other two are much smaller than wood lakes. So I don't know. But what this can signal to us if we watch and have the data to watch algae blooms is they can be sort of the canary in the coal mine, if you will, giving us a first signal that there's change afoot and we need to understand what's going on. Uh, Todd had a so question comment. I walk along there a couple times a day, seeing I have a dog to force me for that. Um, and uh, I noticed it was actually, when I first seen it, it was actually in November of last year, is when the uh, algae bloom started on the north end of the lake that was flowing through the channel. So, um, again, you know, when it showed up in spring here, it disappeared for a while. But I just noticed it again last week where it's really starting to kick up again. So, I mean, all the time that I've lived there, I haven't seen it that extended. I've seen little bits, like you say, in the in May, but never at this time of year. And so it's, the water levels are extremely low. And, uh, you know, I'm a fish tank guy where I seen as soon as I let the water go, it seemed to get in there. So I, I just, I'm curious, like you say, the canary in the coal mine, I definitely think there's something going on with the lake that hasn't been there. So I just wanted to add that, that I am just seeing it here again last week. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I took this from uh, Cottage Life magazine, which is a Canadian publication in May. Um, there's a lot of angst about these boats um, from a lot of places. Um, shallower lakes are more prone to the damage that wake surf boats do. And in a nutshell, the reason that they're so different is not speed, it's because the jet propulsion is angled down. And as we've seen in other studies that I've reported to you, uh, they affect the substrates to a depth of eight meters. So you can easily see the span of the area that these large boats traveling through the channel mm -hmm. can affect on both sides in the lake. So you're not the only jurisdiction grappling with, you know, <laughs> boating issues, if that's any consolation. So what we did with the map on the left is we mapped out areas where uh, power boarding could be a uh, significant issue. And you can see that Wood Lake lights up a lot more than Cal. So Putting that the other way, there's a lot more room for wake surf boats in Kalmalka Lake than there is in wood with, without incurring a lot of uh, damage. Having said that, the shallow arms at both ends of Kalmalka Lake are st still extremely vulnerable. And there's effects that we, we won't know about. 
wake surf boats do a lot of things that uh, water ski boats and other powered craft do not do. Um, they create wakes that are substantially higher and uh, the interval between waves is sh is shorter. So they strike the shore and the bottom with more, more energy. So there's habitat damage, there's lakeshore redis suspension, uh, spills and contaminated discharge, you know, the possibility of introducing aquatic invasives and most definitely accelerated eutrophication because not only do contaminants return from the sediments, so do nutrients. But can those risks be managed? I would argue, yes, if everybody is a responsible boater, I think there's, there's ways and means to do this and do it well. And I know that District of Lake Country has already embarked on an educational campaign with others, and I think that's entirely appropriate. So in conclusion, I would suggest that there are uncertainties about the fate of these lakes and their health that we cannot manage. I mean, climate change, I suppose we all do our part, but I think in the short term, at least, we're looking at increased frequency and intensity of floods and also droughts. So more extremes in both directions. Flooding in particular adds a nutrient surge, does shoreline damage and washes in contaminants. Last fall, and it was worst at uh, the Vernon end of Kalamaka Lake, we had an intense cyanobacteria bloom. And everybody always asks me, well, what's that awful smell? And why do I see these silvery threads in my water? And I can answer that question, absolutely. It was a planktothrix bloom. And then they'll say, why did it happen? And that's where you whip out your crystal ball and you go, well, the best I can estimate is flood years, we have more trouble. But I can't, you know, go beyond that. And I also think we're looking at an increased frequency of, of wildfire and ash is basically phosphorus fertilizer. So if you see a gray layer on a lake, the water below that will be 10 times the amount of phosphorus that that lake normally has. That's, that's a guesstimate based on Okanagan Lake. Mm. So, yay. Um, and then there's, I would suggest there's uncertainties we can manage, and that would be local lake changes, things like developments along the shoreline um, and risks like dredging the channel, where we know we have contaminated sediments, we know that there's metals and hydrocarbons in there that are going to be problematic. I also suggest that if we increase the water exchange between the lakes and by dredging the channel, it's about the same as lowering a dam or taking the stop logs out of a dam. You are going to increase the rate of water exchange between the two lakes. They will equilibrate faster. It's a dynamic that is difficult for us as biologists to predict what the full outcome of that will be. And of course, we will re re increase the risk of large boat traffic along vulnerable stretches of both lakes. Okay. Uh, Penny had a question that, that if you're. Yes, and, and appreciate Sorry. your information. It's very, uh, very worthwhile and interesting. Um, I also thought, you know, with, uh, with not dredging the canal, um, you know, that also can be a problem because uh, you could, it could lead, it would seem to me, to the eutrophication of, of Wood Lake because you're, you're stopping the water from moving out very much over time and particularly when the water levels are lower. And it's my understanding that that's one of the natural results of no less turnover. water flow. The lake can die. That's a good question. Um, we happen to know from the work that we've done that the majority, uh, like 98% of the nutrients in Wood Lake come from its sediment. So the water exchange doesn't impact the eutrophication significantly. What I'm concerned about is transporting algae blooms, mostly from wood to cow. It's very, very rare that it would be a concern in the opposite direction from the algae that are present in the water. So I, 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 your point is well taken, but I think in this case, we know the nutrient balance of Wood Lake because of research that's been done on the fisheries there. But the flow, doesn't that make quite a difference to no. the health of the lake? No, not for eutrophication of Wood Lake because the, the ex water exchange is not the significant part of the nutrient budget. 
Yeah. Now, I don't know if you studied back in the 70s, but uh, there was a huge algae bloom in the 70s. Yep. Um, I was here at the time, and um, we actually take water out of that lake to irrigate. Uh, it was very, very distressing. Yep. Uh, and it was much worse than what we saw this year. Yep. Much worse. You're giving me the perfect segue <laughs> for this conclusion slide, and that is, a mere 40 years ago, that's what the lake shore of the main stem lakes looked like. And you could get lakeshore properties for a song if only we had known. Um, and it can happen again because what happened was that scummy disaster zone, plus the fact that water skiers that were water skiing on cyanobacteria blooms were getting sick, triggered the original Okanagan water study that was done in the 1970s and what came out of that was the sewage treatment plants and what we've been enjoying ever since is the benefit of, of that sewage treatment reducing the nutrient concentrations in the main stem lakes but ever since then and those sewage treatment plants are doing a wonderful job make no mistake but there's a lot more of us here. So what we've been doing is, is ratcheting back what we gained from those sewage treatment plant introductions to Okanagan Lake. And personally, I don't think any of us want to see this kind of, of algae production, but you're exactly correct. That's the situation that the Okanagan was faced with in the 70s. And this map here shows where we are most vulnerable to a repeat performance. So if you look at what's orange there, yeah. Um, I would, yeah, so it's not my job, uh, thank God, to tell you what to decide. <laughs> I'm thrilled with that. I'm very happy with just being, uh, offering what the science can say. But I am really happy to say that we do, we do have some, thing to work with to address this with the science of how these lakes are functioning thanks to the foresight of District of Lake Country and others that have, have funded this research over the years. Otherwise, we'd be throwing darts at a, at a wall and hoping for the best. Uh, Tom, Thank you very much. Uh, continue. So, a um, couple comments. Um, Janet, from the fishing end of things, Okanagan Lake used to be one of the most prolific kokanee fisheries around. Yep. Back in those 40s, so I would suggest it's probably due to the nutrient content of the lake. Um, the same reason down in Kootenay Lake, they actually fertilized the lake yep. and the kokanee took off there. So I find it interesting, not that... Uh, not that uh, that's going to be the final decision maker by any means, but I just I find it interesting how it works with those lakes because Okanagan wasn't very good for a long time. And just in the last couple of years, I noticed there's a lot more fish showing up. So, you know, as far as the canary in the coal mine, the canaries are reproducing in uh, Okanagan Lake. So I find yeah. that interesting. And then one other comment with uh, as far as the canal goes that I've noticed that I haven't noticed in previous years was when I'm behind the community hall, I'll go along the fence there and when the water's up, um, usually that's just swamp water, right? But I noticed the water is actually flowing through there. So um, um, Jeremy did up a nice little thing before, I think, showing that that used to be the old creek used to go through that way. Uh, right so that's the old creek bed well water is still flowing through there um, and I never noticed that until this last couple of years and so I'm just wondering if that's you know as the canal gets more filled up that water is going to find its way into Cal but it's going through the old you know it's same as when you're looking at a creek bed that looks dry well it's not dry there's water flowing underneath it and that's what I think it's happening over there and, um, you know, I don't know how you would be able to tell, right? How you, there would be a tough one to monitor because that's all a big swamp area, right? But it's definitely moving because I was watching the current and I'm watching the fish swim in it. And so, like I say, just another tidbit there that uh, you add to the pile, right? Is that the area? I saw a, a, um, a, an old 1907 map 
maybe it was the railroad. And it showed Marsh, Marsh Lake <coughs> at that area of the the uh, uh, north east uh, Wood Lake and the uh, southeast um, Cal Lake had Marsh Lake in between them, and it's not there anymore. But mm -hmm. uh, don't mm -hmm. know what happened. Whether that when the canal opened, whether that dropped <clears throat> Wood Lake so it wasn't putting water into Marsh Lake, or uh, is that the area you're talking about? Yeah. yeah, no, I think it is. So, like I say, it uh, it's definitely flowing, and when you're watching the fish actually, you know, swimming, moving his tail, and he's staying in the same spot, yeah. it's flowing water, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, you know, from my perspective, these lakes are almost dynamic if you wanted living organisms and we need to um, safeguard them and be cautious with changes that we make because they can have unintended repercussions. We have unlimited, like we can all think of examples of great ideas that... <laughs> yeah, like my stage shrimp. Weren't so great. <laughs> but, you know... Um, I have, I think Kalmaka Lake is one of my hands down favorite lakes, favoritest lakes in the world. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, really have a soft spot for it. And I really do appreciate that you guys are serious about looking after what you've been interested with. Yeah, thank you. Great group have, um, to talk to. Uh, Bill. Oh, uh, Greg will uh, trump you. So I think just maybe in, in Todd, you, you commented about the, you know, maybe the differences. And, and so one of the things, um, you know, when, when we compare Okanagan Lake to Wood Lake, for example, um, o Okanagan Lake is a low productive, uh, low, low productive, low productivity lake. Um, so it's quite a clean water bodies where uh, Wood Lake is actually mesotrophic. And so it's in between a really clean lake and a, and a, and a, and a eutrophic lake, which is more you get more swampy at that point. It's a high productive, that's why we see a lot of kokanee there. I think what we're concerned about is hitting a tipping point where we, where we, where we take that lake back to what it was like in, in the 70s, where we see these massive algae blooms. We're seeing these algae blooms coming now. Are we at a tipping point? And we get to those tipping points, we can get to the point where we squeeze the kokanee right out. Uh, we get more drought uh, conditions and we've had wet years. We get more drought conditions that becomes more significant. So and then we get this this occurrence as as, as Heather was talking about, where we we, we get liberation of, 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 of nutrients back up into the water column from the sediments. And that's a natural process. But when we stir it, when we physically stir it with wakeboard boats and we introduce that stuff in a way that hasn't isn't isn't a natural process that tipping point can become so much more significant. And so that's, I think, really the concern. And when we start moving out those boats to the channels, and if you go back, you don't see that when you're on the boat. You don't see all that stirring up and that stuff does not settle back down. That's all nutrients, that's all contaminants, that's around our water intakes, that's in that shallow area. And so that's a big concern here when we see boats going back and forth through these channels and they're stirring this stuff up and it's staying suspended and it's, and it's, and it's moving contaminants and, and nutrients back up into the water bodies. These are the things we're really worried about. Um, and we're seeing some really negative signs right now. So it's time, I think, to be really careful about what we do because if we lose it, you know, it could take decades, if ever, to bring it back. So it's time to be really, really careful. Yeah, I had, um, Blair had a question for Heather. Okay. You're done, Bill? Yeah, okay. Blair? Thank you. I just wanted to throw the question I had asked of Jason back out there. Right. If we were to embark on this sort of thing, is there a possible way to protect our water, our water uh, source from what that, I mean, obviously the, the sediments and things are in that canal. You know, that's now a given because we know that. So, if those things are reintroduced and they don't settle out easily and they stay in that body, how do we protect our water pumping and our water source there? Or is it possible? <laughs> is it probably the question. <laughs> I, you would probably need an engineer to answer that okay. question. Well, like, how would you set up, you know, some yeah, sort yeah. of perimeter protection on the treated area? I think, I think it's more the question, area. is it possible? Y yeah. It sounds pretty difficult if, if those... I didn't realize that those things stayed suspended once they were back up. Yes. So once they're, they're stayed suspended, they're staying yep. there forever. Yep. So 
we have to protect our water source somehow forever. And in, in all fairness, any dredging event is a one or a every 10 or, or 20 year event. The power boating with these mm. ever larger boats um, is a continuous daily. Yeah. How we discovered this, because the first time that someone asked me, do you think these power boats can be affecting the intake? I went, oh, come on, your intake's at 22 meters. No, I don't think so. But then I looked at all your turbidity data from District of Lake Country, and you had turbidity spikes on long weekends. Yeah. Particularly the sunny ones. I'm like, oh, that doesn't look good. And that's where all that, like that aerial shot you see, that's where it all comes from. Yeah. So I think we need to think about uh, protecting the land around the watershed around the lake, the kinds of stormwater that's entering the lake. We need to think about these really powerful boats that disturb the substrates. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't have an answer, but we keep, we keep, it's like a, a tower of Jenga blocks. Mm -hmm. We keep pulling a block out. Pulling a block now, out. at what point does it collapse? Good. I have, um, yeah, just, just one other question. Yeah. The slide with the uh, not so good outcome there, the old picture, no, the uh, at the end. Okay. Getting there. Of the, the that one. Where is that? What is that? No, no. Where is it? Oh, um, that's a really good question. I didn't take this like photo. I'm happy to say, um, it's from 1970 somewhere. And okay. does anybody recognize those mountains? Well, it could be. It yeah, could be. Like the south end of Good Lake. Uh, no, no, not those hills. No. It's either Vernon or Summerland. Oh yeah. It could be Summerland. I have no idea, but I can tell you that I'll almost stake my reputation that that's filamentous green algae. Yeah. So you could pick it up like green hair. Yeah. It would smell horrid. It would be wonderful for your garden. And it's signaling that there's too much phosphorus in the system. Yeah. That's exactly right. what it's telling you. Yeah. So. Great. Thank you. Um, Thanks so much for your yeah, presentation. I have a couple of more. Work. Thank um, you. Cara? No, no, you, you already had. Yeah. Well, Carl was next, and then Penny, oh, and, then, oh, okay. and then you. My phone's my things are not liking. Um, it was really a more a question for staff. Sorry, Heather. Um, just to put it out there. Um, say we didn't dredge the lake, or the it, the um the canal, and therefore there was no transfer or less transfer between Wood Lake and Oak, Oak, uh, Cal Lake. Um, is there another? Obviously, it's very nice for people to be able to go through the canal. Um, and the next boat launch, I think, for Cal is up at Kukuli Bay. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other option for another boat launch mm -hmm. within the District of Lake Country onto Cal Lake? I am sorry. No, I, I, you, yeah, it, so my thinking is that if we then, if it was further north on Cal Lake, then it may protect that, that southern area with less yeah. weight force is it because there'd be less activity there in ditto less activity on the north end of wood lake so i'm just thinking with the rail trail is there any where looking at that data <laughs> is, there, is there any other option right i mean kukuli bay is a great place to launch and it's good pro you know but if you could you spot. put more There's traffic limit. up there it's not going to be a great place to launch it's already pretty intense well, limit so, them all. So my question to start is, is there another another Maybe, uh, uh, Matt, uh, don't run away though. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I'd say yes, there'd be land acquisition uh, needed um, just based on the topography of where public lands for the rail trail are now. Um, so anywhere that we'd call flat would be private property right now. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're looking for an example, say the Owl's Nest property, um, that's for sale just at the end of Evans Road on Owl's Nest Road. Um, that's 9.9 .9 million. Um, if you look at the um, size of the boat launch and the parking required just at Wood Lake, and Councillor McKenzie can tell you the busyness that that has, you're going to need two to three acres of Kalamelka Lake waterfront to acquire land. Um, anything that we'd have already, say for the rail trail, would be probably hand launched just because there's no sort of additional facilities available in terms of parking. Etc. I presume maybe you'd have a problem with getting across. Why well, could Kukuli Bay get across? The trail yeah, they do own property on the other side of it, but yeah, obviously. Yeah, 
we own the rail trail, so um, yeah. okay. we'd, we'd, I'm, I'm assuming if we did that, we'd give ourselves permissions to, uh, <laughs> to cross the rail trail and do that safely. But in yeah. terms of actual owning land right now, I'd say it. it'd be a challenge, especially um, most of those properties. So the roads are segregated where they don't connect all the way through. You've got the highway, then you've yeah. got um, Butterworth that stops. Then you've got Evans Road that stops. Yeah. Then you've got Thompson Road and Crystal Waters that stops. And then right. you're in RDNO. So it's not the most host hospitable place for boat okay. launches along that side by any means. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Penny, did you want to yes, speak uh, with Heather? Yes, and that was for Heather, I believe. Um, and I wanted to ask, um, with this high turbidity, um, are you've done a fair amount of work in this area. Are you aware of any lakes where uh, the communities involved have prohibited uh, wakeboards, uh, wakeboard boats? And and the uh, you know there must be a size you know that you could determine is is beyond what's reasonable. I know that uh, in our community we've done some some surveys of the public and there's been that suggestion in the past. Um, you know I don't know how that would impact the uh, dredging, but it would seem to me that that's an important thing. I mean, you know, pe if people could still use that that. Isthmus is one thing, but if it's wakeboard uh, boats, like that's another. They do a lot of damage in a lake this size. I mean, this size. So, yeah. maybe. Um, well, I don't know how you do this, but I have one last slide, which is that your research is actually helping some shallow lakes in Alberta. And this is what they've come up with. They want, they used feet. Well, I don't know, maybe they have more intimate connections with Americans. I have no idea. Um, 20 foot depth and 200 feet from shore was where they landed. And these are small shallow lakes, so they're going to pick up the trouble from these boats way faster than the big ones. So, yes, they're going to end up having to address the same thing. This is this is becoming, that's why it was in Cottage Magazine. It's, it's becoming a North American affluent region problem <laughs> yeah. it'd be good to have that information you know um so sure. it is something maybe we need to think about okay you know. and todd had oh go ahead matt uh so through the chair um a lot of this as has been talked heather's information has driven this lot and if you look at my um face in a costume out at uh, duck lake and up at enderby the i'm awake campaign that's me in the um, wake costume, we'll call it. Um, working with Transport Canada on that and uh, District of Coldstream and uh, Regional District North Okanagan, we can't just go and put regulations until we have an educational campaign, which is at least three years in, in time. Um, on the island, there's a couple of places, there's one called Beaver Lake that actually does have regulations um, to control where and how boats go and what type of boats are on there. It's not just as easy as, as this. Um, it's, I don't want to say it's the same process as dredging, but it's multiple jurisdictions in terms of Transport Canada for navigable waters and controlling that. It's signage, it's limiting, then it's enforcement. Um, so is it possible? Yes. Are we there today? Uh, we don't have the ability today yet, but that's why we're going through part of this educational campaign to uh, allow that to be um, part of it. We have um, specifically in the north end of Kalamelka Lake, Conservation officers have been out there more frequently um, patrolling that, um, but it's not about limiting boats. We're trying to educate people now is the first step, and then from there, enforcement. Um, I'd say, unfortunately, probably has to be the next step, but we're not. We don't have the authority to do that yet, but it is possible, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, don't leave then. Yeah. So, you know, this, um, when Heather brought it up before, that's what I thought would might be the best for this, is actually if we put up some boys because the traffic coming from Tween Lakes, they always power up right there and you can see it's muddy. I can see it from the shore. I don't need to look from there, right? So you can definitely tell that that water is getting lower as well. It's just getting piled up. So Roger Bailey, for instance, um, he used to keep his plane around the corner. Well, now he says it just seems to be, you know, more and more layers of sediment. Now he's got to launch on the other side. So when I look at that, I think maybe that might be uh, worthwhile that uh, we throw up some boys and try the educational version saying no wake beyond this zone. I don't know whether we have the ability to do that, but 
I'm just curious, you know, with all the studies that they did there with Heather and that would, you know, that's probably going to make a huge difference for that water supply to start with. Heather and can then, maybe, sorry, just on that yeah. first one, because can't handle more than a couple questions in my head at one time to answer, I'll forget them. <laughs> um, Heather can speak a bit more. Sometimes when we put out regulations, it becomes a target uh, for people, unfortunately. So if we say no wake in this area, you know, water intake here, if we start, we have to be very careful in how we market that people don't take this as um, come here and do this. Um, I hope that most people wouldn't do that, but it's unfortunate that people do. There's a, wait, a, a water intake here and they actually um, create a wake in that area to be like a better word, an ass. Um, but if you can get 80% of them to stop the 20%, you know, you're cutting the problem down quite a ways, right? Yep. So there is, that's part of the educational that ha that should happen. Um, I'd say the other elements we're looking at is uh, such as the paddle trail was intended for part of that too, is to keep people away from the shoreline itself. Um, you know, mm. on Jason, what Jason was talking about for costs with that project, um, just in regional district, North Okanagan, we're talking over a million dollars to protect the rail trail shoreline. Uh, thankfully, we had fundraising that handled a bunch of that. Uh, Lake Country, it was 150000 just on Wood Lake, and that only did the high priority areas. Um, so once you start going in water, we're 1000 minimum per buoy. Um, it's starting to get substantial, but it can be done for sure. Um, it just needs to be part of that, not just one tactic. It needs to be part of a bigger plan to, to address all these things. Yeah, thank you. I got um, Jeremy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I just wanted to add in there as well, too. I think I'm one of the only rare few people that have actually scuba dove in all three lakes. So not only have I seen it from the above, I've seen it from below. And uh, definitely Wood Lake is uh, quite a lot muddier than the other ones. And uh, we all know what happens uh, if you ever scuba dove with novice scuba divers and if they kick up the bottom, how that can enter, enter the water column and uh, not come out. As well, being a water treatment person, and as you were saying that, uh, you know, some of this constituents or some of the, uh, the the compounds when they end up suspended, it's going to take nothing to get them out except for treatment. And sometimes with chemicals, coagulants and stuff, they will stay suspended and charged and pushed away from each other for all eternity. Uh, my other point I was going to make was pretty much already talked about because uh, I've been watching uh, Northwoods Law on TV and it's in Maine and uh, that's part of what they were doing is the police were going around and uh, they were targeting people that were running too close to the shore but since I put up my hand that we've already talked about all that so I have better understanding that we can't just go and put in boys and say don't do this here and don't do that there but that would be my hope that uh, in the future that we would work towards that having no wake zones and enforcement on it too but that will be the future thank you thank you Jimmy uh Kara. Just to echo Jeremy's co um, comment, we're seeing this on Okanagan Lake as well. Um, and it's not just public water intakes, it's private intakes as well. This, this is impacting. So particularly around um, Cars Landing area, kind of from Whiskey Cove up to far as Juniper Cove. You know, I've been out there swimming this year and you get the wake books coming in and there's people on paddle boards and they have to sit there <coughs> because they can't be there with the wake and they just, you know, it's risky so anything that we can do and i appreciate the comments about the buoys but maybe we can have maybe more marked swimming areas maybe people won't respect a, a, a water intake buoy but maybe they'll respect it if it's a marked swimming area and if there's anything we can do to maybe mark more of those areas certainly on the, the card landing section i'm not sure about how it is on, on open Arcan center but a lot of those swimming areas and the water take it intakes are in the same area, so it might actually accomplish two things with one action, which is you know protecting swimmers and also protecting both the private water intakes. I think every house has one, and um, along the shoreline there, and also the public water intakes, both and uh, yeah. private ones from the server larger. Um, nobody else. Thank you, Matt. Um, I just might make one more comment. There. Um, yeah, thanks very much. I mean, there there is a long distance future where power boating is banned yeah. on lakes, and that That's future lake, that future is starting in California right now. Yeah. It's not that far necessarily. I mean, it, it it's very drastic. Obviously, I mean, you know, if you, you were to say this that we were embarking on that, you'd get killed. But 
again, it's the sort of thing, if we don't educate and encourage people to do the right thing, then they are going to ruin it for everybody. And I mean, I think they are anyways. I don't think they're going to do the right thing because I mean, you, you can't really paddleboard anywhere as an Okanagan Lake without encountering a wakeboarding boat. Uh, experienced that yesterday. <laughs> you can't even sail, right? It's hard to sail a boat when a wakeboarding boat because they always got a sea day. They always seem to have to come and check you out because they've never seen a sailboat before. Yeah. But um, yeah, there there is that, and you know Matt brought up Beaver Lake and Victoria that they haven't had power boats on that for years, and there are other lakes in BC where there, are, you know, where power boats or big motor power boats are banned and you're restricted horsepower. So it's um, you know education is going to be extremely important, and I I would say between lakes it's almost worth engaging and meeting with whoever is in control of that area to say hey guys. You're destroying your own community if you don't educate your own population about this, because this is what's going to happen. This could be your future, and your property will be worthless. And what you're doing right. in the sport that you engage in, because you've all bought in that little area, because it, it can't be pleasant to live in. Everybody's so close to each other. <laughs> I couldn't imagine it. But they bought to enjoy the lake. Well, if you can't enjoy the lake anymore, wow. So I think that taking that message directly, you know, and, and possibly even looking at going to schools and, and you know, taking it one step further, you know, the educational side of things, because people just don't realize. They just don't know. Yeah. And that's um, where we can thank, uh, so, hey, thank for again. the research that uh, has been done. And certainly over the years, I mean, 2,4-D was uh, stopped, um, but uh, not without... Uh, a lot of effort, and um, I think wakeboarding is going to have to be looked at with uh, uh, yeah. the serious ramifications from that. But uh, we uh, we seem to be. I I remember when uh, oh 25 30 years ago, regional district we tried to get no petroleum uh, boats on uh, roads. Valley Reservoir. <laughs> the provincial government said, no, no, gotta, can't do that. Uh, they're changing. I think they, they uh, will be looking at uh, some areas where petroleum boats, you don't really need to have big heavy duty motor boats on uh, to enjoy the lake, but we compete with the tourist industry and um, they uh, throw up their hands if we ever thought about banning um, recreational high-powered motorboats on our lakes, but it's going to have to come sometime uh, before too long. We'll keep working at it. Thank you very much. Anybody else? No, we're done. Greg, go ahead. So I, you know, I think when we when we are looking at the risks and the potential consequences, you know, we're, we're risking, you know, the recreational use of the water. We're, 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 we're potentially, the consequence could be a collapse of a fishery our kokanee fishery you know the consequence could be uh the loss of our water supply through here so i mean the consequences can be quite severe and i think you know that that there's a, there's a lot of discussion with the community right now we'll just dredge this thing but okay perfect but what what are the potential downsides and we don't know i mean but it it, it makes sense to err on the side of caution with this stuff and we're seeing the changes and we've seen it in the past i mean we've seen these situations on those water bodies in the past so it can happen again um and then it doesn't work for the you know, you know as you said it doesn't work for the for the for the boaters either at that point and so you know is there i think there there may be a need then to get out in our community a little bit and have this discussion with the community so there's a better awareness of what's at risk yeah. and what this means and why we might not want to go down that road um right now and 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 you know, we're hearing a lot of uh, you know a lot from the, from you know a specific segment of the population that that wants that but what about the other people that they had an opportunity to weigh in and say what their uh, preferences might be and so uh, you know i suggest to council at some point you know maybe we write a report that's um, a bit more public oriented public facing and then go out there and have a, a, have a bit of a process where we can engage with our community around this issue so there's a better understanding of, 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 of what, you know, and 
you know, you know, when, when we're starting to with, with, uh, you know, that consideration of, of, okay, let's, let's go down the road of dredging. The answer might be no, you know, it could very well be no from those regulatory authorities. When we, when we, we go through that, there's no guarantee we'd get to a yes, even, even if we went through that process. So that's another factor I think with it. Yeah. Okay. We better wrap it though. Cause we've got another couple of minutes. I just, uh, I just want to say that, uh, I really like the idea of doing a public process, not in the longer term, in the shorter term. Meet with these people from Tween Lakes and some of these people that are complaining, you know. They I mean, just water. those slides that you showed us, Heather, I think they were so educational. I've seen them before, but you forget. And, and just seeing those, that's really important because people haven't lived here that long. Most people don't know what's happened in the past. And then you see the impacts and you see what causes the problem. You know, it's education. And, yeah. and that's one of the best things. Let people know what's happening. Yeah. We'll get there. Thank you, Heather. Okay, we're done. Um, we go, you, Kyle? You get to. Are you competing? So I think council should maybe grab dinner and Kyle may be able to continue for a while. And if we don't complete, we can always move this to another okay. date and I continue think the conversation. Dishes, okay. yeah. If you ordered. Did Matthew talk to him? Kyle? Matthew talk to him? Did you get more information or do you have it? Good, good. You're surviving all these damn fires? Yeah, sleeping in the tent for two weeks and oh, yeah. the White Rock fire. Oh, geez, that was up. up there. Yeah, and it was um, towards the end we were doing those big back birds. Yeah. The two 600 hectare one yeah. and then they did the 3,000. So oh, wow. just kind of coordinating, getting ready for that. But uh, yeah. it's the first time we got trapped in the middle one night. And uh, there was 25 fire trucks and 80 wild fire guys. They came storming out, and everybody's like, "That's not good." So we went to a safe spot, and we went uh, north, and we got trapped. Turned around, went back to the safe spot, went south, and the fire had blown over on the south. So we went back and just sat in our safety zone for three or four hours, or so, so we could get out of there. We finally got the fire band lifted off the coast. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it came down um, like by public works all through that area. Like, um, seven, six miles the road came down from there, further north, and then it came down by Elm, like, went you know, right down through there. Um, so yeah, there was big trucks in between them. Were you even saying that the horses came by? Yeah, yeah, and at six miles they were. How many fish did you this year? Was like fire, and they were about the houses on fire. And the guys were kind of able to stand and they could hear this noise. The Indian man was there with us. Yeah, the guy. He said, "Watch out! They're coming through." Well, they actually, said like the horses were on fire. Almost. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
No, when they got down there, that, we were actually spent like a good portion of time feeding animals, watering them, like cattle too. It was some uh, highland cattle at all, as well, right at the end of the day. Oxygen that we water out right now. So, yeah, it was quite interesting. That's, that's, that's a good Byron call and see what we're going to do. Yeah, his house was okay. His yeah, got burned. Good. We had a water supply in uh, Alberta. They were going to the lake. They were coming all the way up to the west side of the world. And then we would fill the whole room down to the station. His house was inside. Good. Be fine because it'll be muted. But this is weird. It's funny, Kara said that about the way we're both on the door and the panel person. I don't think it's she was paddling, paddling with the dog the other day. It's a castle on a lakeboard. They just got to come right by it all the time. I don't know what it is. And then she got a thing of the people. She goes off in the dog, goes off. She's never going to fall 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 off. She's never Dog knows how to paddle them. No. I had a dog that didn't like me to swim. He'd always come out to rescue me and then climb up on my shoulder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Our last one was all day and the time. We had to pull out. Who's in there? I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to have to go in there too, and I don't want to make too cold. Yeah, in our old age, Penny, swimming season doesn't start too long ago. We used to start May 11th. Every year, May 11th, we'd go swimming. Wow. That was the old day. Yeah, now it's August something. You guys don't know what cold is. We swim in the Fraser River and the Thompson River. They're never warm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You don't know what cold is. My son, on a two hundred dollar bet, went swimming at a lake just outside of Nakiska mm -hmm. in January, <laughs> where you had to hit to break the ice to get in. Oh my gosh, that's dangerous. <laughs> that's that's the Oyama um, two hundred dollar. Yeah. January first. January polar bear, polar bear dip. dip. They had to cut the ice out so that you could go swim in the one year. Never in my life would I feel like that. I, it's a real thing. I've done it three times. Yeah. I've lost it. And it's not the cold of the water. It's no, how it's cold the, the air is. Okay. Yeah. So if the air is like minus 10 mm -hmm. and you're going in, that water actually feels a little warmer. So it's above if it's, freezing. If it's like 10 degrees out and that water is like a quarter degree, that's the worst. Because that's to me when I go under, it hits the head. It's just like, oh, that's cold. <laughs> that's the worst. For me, anyway, because I've done it three times, and I've done it on both sides of it. Yeah. Way better to go when it's really well, we cold out. Yeah. You swim across the lake, you can kind of plop it does that several times a year. And he says in the middle, is that current is stronger? Yeah. It's cold. Yeah. Like I just swim across the lake. Yeah. In the center of that lake, it gets it. Bruce Duggan used to 
go for a swim every day of the year yeah, down there. in the Oriama. And then he moved to Cart Landing and he yeah. did down there too. Across. No, not across, just out in front of it. I mean, very, very scrooby. I remember as a kid watching him jump in the lake at Woodsdale every day and got across my ass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Germany and Austria, they have all these little places with stairs that they creep so that you can go and put your legs in the cold water running around the glaciers. Oh, yeah. It's all over the place. You, go and you walk in and it's freezing. <laughs> and some places have little benches that are all set up along so you can sit on the side and dangle your, your leg in. That water when we went on the river cruise, right through Germany and stuff, that water is pretty high. Like that's, a, that's a river, and yet you got to be pretty shallow before you can see the water. That's just a good water. Did you go up through the Danube? Yeah. I can carry out. I don't know if that's what they have. Yeah, they do the water skiers. Gary's the youngest one. He did a stunt for a film in uh, Greenland, where he's skiing down a glacier and then he picks up a rope attached to a boat and right from the bottom of the glacier starts water skiing across the water <laughs> on his snow ski. Wow. It was a super cool stuff. And we, when we bought his house, we went into it and we had all his pictures like that. That's a top bottle thing and that was one of the things he had there. No, Greg Castle. The middle brother? He had some he had yeah. diabetes in a bad way, but yeah. he was also had some drug problems along with it. Yeah. Gary was a real thing. His father was a doctor, Kenny. Right? Yeah. Your father? Yeah. 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 Athens? Doctor doctor was he doctor? He was an Olympic diver. So George Athens was the oldest of the brothers. He was the world champion water skier for years. Greg was a really good water skier, but he was also a snow skier. He won the Canada Games at Saskatchewan at Black Star Mountain. But he couldn't generally be a freestyle skier because freestyle just emerged. And Greg, so George was the world champion water skier. Greg was the world champion three stars. Huh. Gary was on the Alpine national team of so ski racing. He was number one of the start gate in Sarajevo at the Olympics, which is like, I mean, he didn't, he didn't get a great time, but being number one is not a great thing, but it's something to live by. <laughs> First guy that skated at the Olympics in the Valley. You break the trail. Yeah. Yeah. He's a good guy. That was illegal, you know. Mm -hmm. Doubly. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> My brother was a, a son newspaper carrier. He won a contest of some sort, oh, and that was a. I think he had to sell more subscriptions or something. I don't know where it was, or never missed a delivering a paper or something. But um, he got a a bicycle as a. Uh, it was called called a Triumph or something. It was an English made bike. Damn, it was a good bike. It was, you know, around yeah, something like that. Yeah, and, it was um, and way better than the uh, clunky old CCM that uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Down on Wood Lake Yeah, and that was the day before gears or anything. But that rally, you could go up the hill pretty hell. Like, uh, I mean, you could with your CCM, but you had to work at it. Yeah. But well, it was really easy pumping. I inherited it because he was six years older than me, so he was soon out of bicycles. Oh, yeah.
that's what I do. Family lives there, right? That's the, that's the farm, the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, the farm. Yeah. <laughs> I was kind of worried. I thought, oh, what's going on down there? <laughs> so what do you expect now? Right? Was that the call at four? Yeah. I see the, in the carpenters, yeah, they're all the way up in the Write everything up into a job. We write everything up. Nothing to do with what we want. Are you ready? Mr. Mayor, if you're okay, I could proceed while yeah. everyone's eating. Make it short, I mean, there is no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have our undivided attention now. Okay. Uh, cost recovery on satellite or small water systems. Uh, so the purpose of this presentation is to gauge council opinion on cost recovery options for improvements made to small water systems. Uh, it, on this presentation, I'm going to talk mainly about the Coral Beach water system, but we do have one other small water system, that being the Lake Pine water system but the improvements required on the Lake Pine water system are, that have been identified to date are much less significant than the ones on Coral Beach water system. So I'm gonna focus on that one for this presentation. Uh, the Coral Beach water system was taken over by the district in the late 90s. Uh, it required replacement of the lake intake pipe that went out into Okanagan Lake, the pump station itself, and also the reservoir. The reservoir was actually an old wood stave reservoir that one of the operators always tells me he, he went up there to take a look at it one time and found a raccoon living in it. <laughs> so uh, that needed to be rebuilt and replaced. Um, at the time, the property owners were given the option of the extent of the upgrades they wanted to do. The uh, property owners were given basically a bare minimum to keep this thing running all the way up to, uh, I'll call it the Cadillac version, where they could replace the, uh, the water lines and upsize the reservoir and all that. And ultimately the property owners at the time, this is in the late nineties, elected to just the bare minimum improvements. And so what happened is they voted to create a local service area in the late nineties, the district took it over and uh, made the improvements. And since then, other than a very small section of water main that got replaced last year, due to it uh, was this old steel galvanized water main. There's been very little improvements made to the system. Uh, the Coral Beach water system does have uh, some issues. The reservoir is basically sized strictly for domestic supply and is not adequate for uh, fire protection. The pump house and water mains are nearing the end of their useful life. And it does not meet the IHA water quality objectives to uh, be considered <coughs> It basically, at bare minimum, would need UV treatment added to the to the uh, the system. So, some potential options that staff have explored for this water system, and one is connect to the water system to the Beaver Lake source if the Cars Landing servicing strategy proceeded proceeds. Uh, approximately four million dollars would uh, for this water system was thought to be its uh, portion for that. Uh, uh, process or that option, or if that didn't proceed, the other option then really would be to replace and correct the existing deficiencies. And currently that's estimated at approximately $5 million. So really the crux of the issue and why we're here to talk to council today is how does council view the small water systems and, and cost recovery? Should it be folded into the Lake Country rate structure, basically the rate structure that everyone is, is already a Lake Country water user uh, pays and that it folded into the financial model and the financial plan on the cost recovery. Or because it's a satellite water system or their own water system, should they be more looked at as a local system user pays? So that's financed by the local user group through whether that's through its rate structure or if we are able to convince the local population in that area that the improvements are in benefit to them and they would create a local service area and basically be recovered through parcel tax. Um, with that, I look forward to the discussion and listening to council's opinion. Cara. <clears throat> How many users are we talking about on the Coral Beach? 
The Coral Beach water system has approximately 50 users, 50, 50 users. properties. So 40 million divided by 50. I, I did the higher number, oh, 5, 5 million, million divided, divided by 50. 50 yeah. 5,000 okay. dollars per year over 20 so, years, approximately. 5,000? Per property per over year. 20 years. Okay, thanks. Would be to recoup that at that dollar value per Ready? year. I don't know okay. others may be listening. So, uh, first of all, just off the top of my head, I'm thinking as you're talking about, the, and I know we've had this in our water uh, committee, but joining that coral beach up with Beaver Lake, it just, it, my, it boggles my mind. It's like the furthest away, and I cannot see the common sense in it. You know, the the maintenance cost of that line doesn't make any sense to me because over time that's going to be a ridiculously long line. So I'm just going to mention that. <laughs> I do think that because these people did not put the maintenance cost and may not be the current people, but the people who developed down there over the years didn't, I, I think that they should be paying a parcel tax. However, at some point it may you know it may be reasonable if it's to the overall benefit of the community to look at some subsidization of that and, and i say that without knowing the ins and outs but i wouldn't be totally opposed to looking at some subsidization of that but because i believe that from my understanding and knowledge of these things that the appropriate reserves weren't put there the, the work hasn't been done over the years to maintain it in a, in a good status. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> What's the, um, is, is, is the, a reservoir uh, factored into that um, uh, Coral Beach one? Uh, the total I mean, system replacement, the $5 million? Pardon? The total system replacement, the $5 million? Yeah. Yes, that's with a, an adequate and size reservoir. The uh, and that with the reservoir, would they use um, uh, Okanagan Lake water? Yes, if we continue to operate that as a small water system without extending the Beaver Lake source, we'd look at that as uh -huh. the only source really in that area that's viable. Uh -huh. would probably be most likely Okanagan Lake. Okay. And could to you use it. also reach Barclay Road with it? <clears throat> Um, that would be, you could, of course, but that would be more of a discussion. Are we looking to expand? The users energy? up there, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, Cara, I had next. Don't thank, turn, thank don't you. turn that on. Don't Can't hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, <coughs> you this had is your taking me by surprise. Um, no, I would no. kind of like, could we maybe get a bit more heads up as to what's going to be talked about at the strategy session? Because I'm, I would like to have a look at the slides and have my thought processes before we actually came to the meeting. Um, it's a little bit there. Um, so um, my question would be: One, how does this work for long? We just had the improvement at RS Marshall Park and Stewart. And also Ewan, which is the same situation where you have a facility of some type that's been taken over by the district, and those costs were fully covered. So if it's okay for sewer, why is it not okay for water? Just the type of logic would be helpful to explain you. And also, when we're looking at the car landing water servicing solution, um, I suppose my one question would be if it's costing five million to get a full qualitative upgrade to this system. 50 users, and it is literally right next door to the east side utility. Like the difference <coughs> is actually, you could run it in my naivety, you could run it up Mackey Road's trail because those two systems mm -hmm. are that close. Is this not an option if we're improving the quality system to make it capable of supplying east side utility customers and Coral Beach? <coughs> And do the whole end from that end of the municipality. But anyway, I had uh, Bill and Blair. You <laughs> can't talk. Bill, Bill's dying. Hey. Oh, do you get an answer? Yeah. So 
the first comment is very valid. The uh, the we had the two satellites uh, sanitary disposal systems that were paid for by the overall uh, sewer rate structure as correct, and that's one aspect that obviously council has wasn't been, paid by the users in the no that was paid for by the overall sanitary rate structure. Oh yeah, how do we do that? Okay. Hey? I, I, I thought. Why did we do that? Yeah, no, I thought improvements were uh, done initially, uh, paid for by the users, and then uh, eventually brought into yeah. the rate. So how we we did it? It's a it's a Lake Country owned and operated sanitary disposal system. It needed some improvements and we incorporated it into the financial plan to do that with the existing rate structure for sanitary sewer. And so the question is, do we do continue that model with water as well? Or do we look at more of a user pay system with the small water systems? <coughs> hmm. um, and then the other question would be, for the uh, uh, bringing in the east side, utility. east side utility, merging it to Coral Beach is definitely something that we would have to explore. But again, the uh, there might be some cost saving opportunity around the reservoir itself that, that could be shared, but the whole piping network and everything in the east side utility, my understanding is also right at the end of very uh, useful life. So that it's a much higher cost than just 5 million to, to attach the two, right? Sure. Let's not forget, we did evaluate, you know, looking at our, at our own supply from Okanagan Lake for those combined systems. And that was more expensive than, than extending Beaver Lake. That's why the Beaver Lake option uh, was preferable when we looked at that servicing concept. So, you know, we we could, and and, and obviously that didn't include include Moberly and and uh, and and Barkley. But when we start looking at East Side and just look at the cost, what East Side was was facing here, in in their own study, um, it's a very very expensive undertaking as well. So you know, we we've, we've done a lot of that evaluations, and and the lowest cost solution for Cars Landing as a community is that extension of, of Beaver Lake Water. So I would, I, you know, we, we could look at just those two components together, but it's not going to be cheap. We've got, we know what, we know what east side is already. We're going to look at just adding 50 units on. One of the, one of the things that makes, I mean, it's, it, it's, let's face it, it's super expensive to service water out there. It doesn't matter what we do. But one of the things that makes Cars Landing by itself, or Coral Beach by itself, relatively inexpensive, and I'm talking relatively here, is that reservoir just services those lower lower elevation properties? We don't have to pump it up again and cascade down. So it's, you know, I, I think really where we're at is 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 East Side is going to have to make a decision around are they are they going to join the district um, <clears throat> within the district policies or go it alone? And if they're going it alone, then Coral Beach. You know, as a private utility, then Coral Beach is probably going it alone. And then it really comes down to how do we treat this from a policy perspective around does it match, you know, what we did with sewer or is it standalone? And I think the difference here is they were given an option earlier on 20 years ago. What do you want to do? Do you want to bring it full standard or do you just want to do the cheap and dirty? They elected to do the cheap and dirty. That, you know, that discussion never happened with the, with the sewer users. We, we took that over and we just embedded them in. So I think maybe that's the difference here that when we're thinking about the policy decision around, you know, what are we doing here? And the reason was, I mean, those sewer systems were fairly new. They were functioning. They were okay. The water system was not. The water system needed an improvement. Okay. Bill. I may, I may have missed it, Kyle, but... Um, we were talking about funding either through the local service area or to fold it into our water rates, say. Eh? And surely there's a way 
of mitigating the cost to the local user by rolling some of the cost into our water rates. I wonder if that's an opportunity for us to consider. I know it would uh, it would require the rest of the population of Lake Country to pay for someone else's deficiency, which I'm not that really comfortable with. But if it was a small degree from a lot of people, it could change the heavy hit $5,000 a year for 20 years. It could reduce that to something a lot more manageable for the families down there. Um, is that possible? That kind of a funding formula? So you're talking about basically a hybrid system between the two. Hybrid, yeah. Yeah, and that that if that's the direction of council. That is what we would look to implement. And we have no estimates on what would what that would look like. Uh, not at this current time, but the even with folding this all into the Lake Country rate structure, the impact on the other uh, users is pretty minor in comparison. We just looked at our financial model and folding this in with it and including uh, some, a bunch of the other projects identified. We're looking at uh, uh, basically an inflationary increase if we do get some grant funding three, for our water treatment plan. Three, four percent. Yeah, it's somewhere in that range. But and that's what this folded in already. And then it, 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 the impact is not drastic overall on the 20 year financial model to fold this in. So it'd be even less if we do a hybrid system. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 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 thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I have a bit of an issue with making a decision right now without having put some thought into this. Yeah. Right. I, I don't. I I think that that kind of approach is it's we, just not fair to us. Because um, my initial reaction is they chose, they made a decision, and is it fair to say to everybody else, well, we're going to pick up the bag for these guys? Um, you know, they'd be looking at, at the homes of, of, you know, 80 percent of these people and saying, well, you know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a big income difference, right? There's a massive income difference. At the same time, I'm kind of like, I kind of maybe personally favor some sort of hybrid type of system. I don't think that the rest of the community should pick up the full bag for it, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know what? I'm not. I'm not uncomfortable about taking the Beaver Lake water system there, because there there may be costs in, in maintaining that line, but the costs surely in maintaining that line would have to be outstripped by manning a satellite station, servicing that satellite station all the time, instead of putting all our infrastructure, filtration, and all those future things we want to do, and whatever we might have to do in the future. You know, if if there's a zebra mussel thing or whatever. All those other things, having one purveyor of water is always the best solution because you can focus all your technology in one place and all your manpower instead of having manpower spread out all over. So I'm not, I don't really have an issue with taking the Beaver Lake water there. Um, and I think it would help solve the east side water problem. Oh, yeah. Thank you. You would. Yeah. Oh. And so the last two times we uh, met with council, we discussed. Uh, some of the things around the cars lighting servicing strategy and, and how does Coral Beach pay did come up. So I thought potentially council was ready to have that conversation. I apologize if I brought this a little too soon. I, if it pleases council, we could take it to the steering committee and, uh, yeah. and and explore this in further depth prior to bringing it back to council again. We, I would, I would, love I would like to see the reports beforehand actually to talk about them and have the steering yeah. committee have yeah. a whole discussion but uh, i had todd penny and carl and then we're going to have to cut it off because uh, uh we need a short break before the council meeting thank you Mr. So can um, i just add really quickly sorry and jump in this was never intended for a decision right this was intended uh, for a discussion oh, and to introduce was. the topic and have council give some time to consider it. This is a strategy session, so no decisions can be made during strategy sessions no, anyway. No, and it was preferred that this information, it had been indicated previously that this information be brought forward during a strategy session so council could have a discussion and then brought to a regular council meeting for more contemplation. So that's why it's here in front of council now. Yep. Okay, it just sounded like it's strategy. Wanted. It sounded like you wanted the decision yeah. today. But uh, okay. <laughs> um, we had I, I had Todd, Penny, and Carl. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Mayor. 
Awesome. Thanks, Carl. Um, so, um, brings up a couple questions. Uh, obviously, with our uh, recent yeah. uh, request to let out more water from the Beaver Lake system and us saying that we can't really afford that, if you're going to add um, potentially, what, 50 on the one and how many on the other, uh, you know, I, I would want to make sure that we can actually um, supply that comfortably without having issues because, um, you know, if the, the province does come to us and mandate that we have to release X mm -hmm. amount more, we're not going to have water there. So a couple questions would be, can you increase the Beaver Lake source, like obviously without flooding people out, and how low can it go before it becomes an issue? And I'm just curious on those numbers. I don't. I can't imagine you have those off the top of your head, but that would be something that I would want to see. So we have the we know what we're dealing with because the unintended consequence would be we're creating an issue where there isn't one right now, even though it's cheaper. Sometimes cheaper is not better. So I, I just I would want to see those kind of numbers before I said yeah I won't like Beaver Lake source versus the other. So that would be my my big concern on that one. Um, and uh, as far as the Okanagan Lake um, source goes, when we take the water out of there, do we have to treat that at all? Like, is that part of the well, added I'll cost? answer in reverse it? order. Yeah. Yes, we do. Okay. And we currently disinfect with chlorine on, on that source. And um, what at minimum, IHA would be looking on that source to add to meet their treatment requirements would be UV treatment along with filtration deferral. With a filtration deferral application and acceptance. So just basically saying that you don't need to filter that water. You can get by with just chlorine and, and UV treatment. Mm -hmm. And then as far as water availability, we did do a big water availability analysis. Uh, we went through the steering committee, the water uh, service advisory committee, and brought that to council this spring, looking at the water availability on the Beaver Lake source. Uh, the, at, with the cars landing uh, group added to that, the growth projections over the next 20 years, and given how we have historically operated with our releases, we were very comfortable with our water availability we had up in Beaver Lake. Now, in reoccurring drought years, we're, we're, we were in trouble, but we're in trouble now in your reoccurring drought years. But with the recent things that have come to light with the province mandating releases, we're going to need to go back to the steering committee and have another discussion about how do we want to look at this source and mandate it. And it, is this the most, the, the thought process at that time, does that still hold up with this new information? Right. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, you've said some things that I was hoping you were thinking, <laughs> and that's excellent. Um, so um, I guess one of the things that also occurred to me is when we make this commitment, we're looking at maybe a 50 year commitment. It's a long, long term commitment when you put in a, a whole connection like that. And this area in 50 years might see a huge amount of growth down Cars Landing. Um, you know, just a matter of getting a sewer line down there. Um, and, and it might even come from Vernon, who knows, um, you know, and, and the thing is then you're looking at areas like Juniper Cove, we've had that application come to us about three times now, um, and then there would be redevelopment in that area. So we, we need to think when we're making that decision, it's a long term impact and what are our priorities for that Beaver Lake, you know, source. So I appreciate what you said. and. I just wanted to add a little bit to it. Thank the you. other thing about fish requirements, that's that's uh, yeah. yeah, that's pretty significant. Talked to the minister this morning about that. And it's a little over the top in my opinion. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Carl. <laughs> um, two quick questions. One to just clarify on the agenda. The agenda item beforehand was the Oyama Canal, pretty clear what that one is. Cost recovery on satellite water systems, plural, sorry. Didn't know what we were going to be talking about, so it would be helpful just to have um, a little bit more clarity mm -hmm. in the agenda, just so that I understand now. But it could, you know, Coral Beach water supply plus cost recovery would have made a lot more sense to me. And that's taking quite 
quite the front. So that would be good for the article. And if you can get applied ahead of time, that's fantastic. Um, so my other question would be the Crawfish water supply, they're paying at the moment on the District of Lake Country rate system, if I'm understanding correctly. They don't have a separate bill. Correct. They pay the same amount as okay. all the other users. So they pay <clears throat> for every other improvement that the district has done and is going to do. So they'll be expected to pay for the improvements on the Beaver Lake supply and the Okanagan Lake supply work that we've just done. They will pay contributed to part of that as well. Technically, yes, through their rate structure. Yes, yep. they did. Yep. So I would just say that I put that out there to say that although they don't actually get any supply from Okanagan Lake um, as part of the main system, and they don't get the Beaver Lake supply, but they have been contributing as part of the rate structure to all of that work, then that equally, of, theoretically, of no benefit to them, but they're contributing. So I think that goes into an argument to me that there's that there's balance in sense in the rate structure because there's 50 of them contributing to developments that are applying to the whole of the community or on the municipal water. So mm -hmm. if that wasn't happening, then I think there's a really strong argument to go with the local service area, but it is <coughs> happening. So if they are already in the Lake Country rate structure, already paying for improvements, so it's a little bit back in their direction this time but if i might just add one comment to that um i'm not sure exactly what portion of their rates is is split into capital improvements and operations okay. but what does happen each year is their operations uh budget typically falls a little short of what they actually need and so it actually is drawn from the other right. user groups okay. that are paying for them but they just their operational costs <clears throat> I'd have to check with okay, finance. No, but I mean, maybe we can, could that be part of the steering, the information to the steering committee and then they can assess, but I could. Sure. Yeah. Okay, good. You better pack it and we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. All right. Mass.